So welcome, welcome all to what is the launching of Alta Academy. Uh, the European Legal Tech Association aims to bring you more content, more understanding, and for that, we will start a series of webinars. And what better way to start by starting with an overall view of uh, the topics that are most pressing in the field. So exactly, challenges of the field of legal tech tools and how can uh, uh, companies, we call it companies, to be um, uh, more broad, can train their own stuff. My name is Marisa Monteiro Borsbaum. I will be leading the Elta Academy project and I'm also um, ambassador at Elta for a few years for Portugal where I start the chapter. I'm a lawyer of profession, but I'm a legal tech enthusiast. So I have much to learn as well. Today with us, an exquisite panel. We have Ms. Claire Moore, the program director of the International Law uh, um, uh, program of the Hague University of Applied Science. We have uh, Mr. Rune Sviers. I never managed to say properly your name, Jeroen, I apologize. He's the vice president of ELTA, but he is a pro, I can say that. So he's also the lead of um, communities, uh, of uh, the Dutch community in legal tech. And I will say a little bit more, but we have also Sir John, uh, that is the health ambassador for Serbia, but because our memory doesn't allow us to know everything, I have my own notes. So very briefly, Miss Claire uh, comes from a non-legal background, and she will tell you more about that. She will come. She comes from uh, the area of business and what we would call a technical area, and then. Uh, Jeroen, as I say, is the founder of the Legal Innovation Agency, uh, is the head of strategy uh, Blue Tech uh, in uh, Elta. He is the ambassador for the Netherlands uh, and now he's in the board and he's the vice president. Uh, but he's a colonist of legal innovation. So you see a lot of articles also uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, Jeroen and he's the co-founder of Dutch Legal Tech among others. He will tell you more for sure. So John, um, younger, but with an amazing path as well. Uh, you are founder and CEO of something that you will pronounce uh, but is law tech as well. I will not dare. Um, you are the creator of Legal Transformation Program with VWC in Serbia. Uh, you are also now uh, co-leading uh, um, the group of specialists of education in legal tech in ELTA, uh, co-founder of Legal Hackers, Novi Sad, so many, so many, so many. So I could not be happier of having you all here. And today, it will be a round table with a non-conference model. What that means, no presentations. We will have three rounds. We'll start by understanding who are these professionals, who are also the persons and the past behind today's um, invitation. In a second round, we will have the a little bit more the analysis. What are this, this diagnosis of the problems that they can see in their own perspectives? And in a third round, what could be immediate reactions to mitigate this challenge? Hopefully, you'll be able to participate with the Q&A. I will be monitoring this Q&A. And if we are good in time, we will still have this opportunity. If not, all the questions will be, for sure, uh, reaching uh, uh, their targets. So with no further ado, let's start. Ms. Claire, could you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your path uh, that arrives to this uh, uh, program director um, in the University of Applied Science. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Marissa. Thank you for the uh, invite and also to ELTA for organizing this. Um, so as already said, my name is uh, Claire Moore. Um, it, it's nice that I can see my fellow panelists uh, because otherwise I'd feel like i am gone back to teaching last year when all the screen is black. <laughs> you are just teaching uh, to a blank screen and hoping that there are people listening to you. Um, as said, uh, I'm currently now the program director for international law um, and I started that position um, on, on August of this year, so it's quite short. Um, where I come from is I'm actually an engineer, uh, electronic and uh, electrical engineering, and very much in the area of telecommunications. Um, and I came to Holland, which is now, um, I have to say, more than 25 years ago, so a very long time ago, I'm half Dutch at this stage, um, to work for what was then known as KPN Research. So I was very much involved in uh, research of telecommunications, both in uh, mobile and uh, fixed telecommunications, and everything that kind of made it work. Um, so very long time ago, um, there used to be AXE projects, and I worked with uh, institutes across uh, Europe, where we were looking at how we would use our mobile phone to do a, yeah, to buy things on online. And that was before we had the smartphones that we have uh, now. And although that technology is not something we use here, um, you do see that in other countries and in developing countries, banking is done on very simple telephones and, and has a lot of, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of things you can do without having actually a smartphone. So it was it was really exciting uh, to do that. Um, about 18 years, I worked also in a startup uh, for about four years, and that was an intelligent agent startup um, that was helping. Yeah, we, we had all sorts of solutions we were doing, and one of them was also searching through documents so that you could do better document management systems. Um, uh, but at, at a certain moment in time, unfortunately, the internet bubble burst here in uh, the Netherlands and we sold that company on. Um, and that for me was a moment of reflection um, and also where that I ended up in, in education, where I had two roles. One was um, in IT education uh, at that stage in MBO level and a international business, which was at MBO4. Uh, so I worked for the Mondrian company here in uh, The Hague. And after a number of years, I switched from Mondrian to the Haagse Hochschule, so the, the Hague University of Applied Sciences. Um, and I've had a lot of pleasure there, uh, first of all, within the International Business and Management Studies program, where my role was to look at, okay, you know, IT, has changed international business as well, just like it's it has and is continuing to change uh, law, but definitely international business. Um, and I took my experience to, to, on the one side, teach students, you know, what were these changes? Because they don't always realize all of the differences because for them, you know, they've always had an email, they've always had um, a, a computer in their house um, and sort of telling them what I started at KPN Research, we all had, a computer but if I went to visit KPN there was one computer in the office and not everybody individually was working on a computer and that was something that sometimes blew their mind which is always fun uh, but at the same time looking towards with the internet with with the business students going what is it you need to understand of technology so you can use it so I've always also now within education I, I love seeing how we can use um, technology within education, um, but not just to use it. There has to be a function. So where can technology actually help and support us to do our job better so that we have then the space to do more and not just use a technology for the sake of it? Um, and one of the, the very interesting things, especially in education in the last years, is Many of my colleagues, although we had a lot of, um, we, we've had a learning management system for years. Um, at that time, we were using Blackboard within uh, the Hague University of Applied Sciences. Most people used a very small amount of the technology. They only used it to upload documents and, uh, and that was it. A few people would try having a webinar or an online class. Then 
two years ago, <laughs> we had a pandemic. And it's amazing the, the, the switch that has happened in, in, in that year. And, and really, that pandemic really pushed uh, also how IT and technology has been used within in universities. And now we have proctored exams, we have online exam systems. Those things were non-existent and, and weren't even, you know, if you try to talk to them about those things with some lecturers, they're like, no, you could not do this. And, and now there's a lot more possibilities. And an interesting thing is coming up in what you keep but also the importance of the classroom and how you can do the things uh, there. Um, yeah, so as I said, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, uh, I'm, but I am an IT enthusiast. Um, and it, is, it was also very interesting for me when I applied for the job. Uh, I also questioned myself, you know, can a non-lawyer lead a legal team? Uh, and of course, it was very much to do with what our legal team needed at the time. I do have a lot of education management um, knowledge, but it was also for me very interesting to see how also AI, but all sorts of elements of technology are actually influencing law. And that in a way, the similar things of when I was teaching a business student about websites, they don't need to, they're not all going to go out and design a website. Some of them may because they'll get involved in marketing, but not all of them but they may need a website to be built for their organization. So they need to understand some key principles so that they can then take that and know when they're talking to somebody what they can get out of the system. It's the same with um, data analysis. Not everybody is going to be a data analyst, but you have to have the language so you can talk to somebody to go, hey, this is what I want and I know if we have a database that we can get this information out. So it makes it quite exciting to see um, also how I can bring that kind of knowledge into the team going forward. I don't know if there's any questions at this moment in time. Not than... yet, not yep. yet. Uh, I do also hope that uh, 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 our Q&A handles a little bit, at least they know um, uh, the, the power of this panel. Uh, and understand what they can uh, question as well. And I already think that when you uh, put a question mark after can a non-lawyer lead a legal team, um, I cannot uh, uh, tell you the joy that uh, our um, panelist, Jeroen, <laughs> our vice president, will have to complement this thought. So I, I think it's, it, it, it's the best way to proceed. Jeroen, tell us a little bit about you, <laughs> how do you arrive to uh, 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 this path and, and where are we standing at this point? So we can start talking more things, but more about you, Jeroen. Thank you, Marisa. Yeah, that's a long time ago. So like Claire, I'm also a non-lawyer, um, but I started working um, for a law firm more than 25 years ago. This is, it, it, it gives a sneak peek of my age, but uh, uh, I, I started as an IT director for a law firm here in the Netherlands. Uh, I did it for quite some years. Uh, like I said, uh, 25 years working for law firms in various management positions. The last 10 year focused full time on the more innovation part of, of the legal industry. Uh, I was an, uh, um, an innovation director for a large law firm in Amsterdam. Uh, and we did a lot of things trying to innovate that law firm, which is quite difficult. Uh, it's, I think the legal industry, changing the legal industry is quite difficult. Uh, and it's, it's, it's because, because of the people who are working in the legal industry, because they're not very open-minded to technology. And also uh, the business model is still quite com comfortable, especially when you look at law firms. So like I said, I did that uh, for 25 years for law firms. Uh, I was also uh, a managing director for a consultancy entity of a law firm. We were the first in the Netherlands who offered consultancy services, so legal tech consultancy services to their clients, to the law firm clients. Uh, and that means we help them with their transformation of the legal departments of the large corporates. Uh, names like Nike Europe, uh, Vodafone, uh, various banks, G-Star, many more. Uh, so we help them. So we help the legal people within those corporate uh, firms in uh, using uh, legal tech technology or, or uh, transformation their department. So looking in the work they did. So uh, 
uh, a commodity work, you can use technology and high end work, you have to put in people. Uh, we did that quite successfully, uh, but then the regulator in the Netherlands did come and forbidden us to, to offer as a law firm consultancy uh, services. Like I said, innovation in the legal industry is quite difficult, so we had to shut that uh, that down. Uh, what, mm, yeah, like mentioned, uh, I was quite disappointed in that, um, uh, and I left uh, the legal industry because my idea is changing the legal industry from inside is quite difficult. So let's turn that more from the outside. So I started my own uh, uh, innovation agency called Noun. Uh, what I do there is I support. Uh, still covered legal departments, so the, the large uh, corporates in the Netherlands, not only in the Netherlands, but also in Germany and Belgium. Um, I help uh, legal of law firms with their transformation, so creating product for their clients, uh, working more efficiency within law firms, uh, using technology within law firms. Uh, so I help them with that. I'm a shareholder in two legal tech AI startups. Uh, one is called Lin. Uh, they use... Um, AI to review contracts. Uh, and the other one is called Blue Tick. They use algorithms in search uh, to find better, uh, a better content and help lawyers with finding better content because lawyers are not very good in search. Um, I'm also head of a project uh, for the Dutch government in uh, access to justice. Um, yeah, like I said, many things. I'm also involved in the Netherlands in, in a lot of uh, educational projects. I'm a, I'm a guest lecturer for many universities, normal universities and applied sciences. Uh, and I'm uh, in the advisory board of the Legal Tech Alliance. Uh, so the University of Applied Sciences uh, together who worked out their curriculum for legal tech. When you look at the market, I would say that's a very interesting approach. Yeah, yesterday, there was, a, there was a, a publication of Thomson Reuters, uh, a survey, and they said, uh, there was a raise of 7% of using technology by, by law firms. I created my own survey uh, within LinkedIn, which said, okay, is this used for office tech or is this used for legal tech? Because uh, my idea is uh, not a lot of law firms are using real legal tech or changing their products or their business models. And 80% uh, of, the, of the people who uh, uh, um, helped me with, with the survey said, it's 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 about office tech uh, and working remote in the in the corona or covid times and that's what i see when you look in the area of 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 uh, the legal domain law firms still don't change uh, the reason is they have a very comfortable uh, uh, hourly business model uh, uh, if you make their business more efficient uh, the turnover will be less that's their feeling. But when you look at their, their clients, it's changing. So like I said, I'm advising a lot of corporates also in this case, and there's a lot of pressure of the CFOs to the general counsel because they have to do more for less. Uh, and, and less is less people. So they're bringing in a lot of more technology currently, in, in especially in the commodity part of the, of the corporate legal departments. Uh, and they're also bringing in different skill sets. So not uh, people who are trained by universities or the law schools, but they're bringing in uh, people from, uh, which have a much more practical approach from, from uh, uh, a University of Life Sciences where, where, where Claire, for instance, works. And they have a, they're bringing in a lot of different skill sets uh, to, to those corporate legal departments. And because of their corporate legal departments, they are, are in the front row of, of, of change, I would say, and not the law firms. Uh, eventually, a law firms will have to change also. Uh, so you will see also uh, them coming, uh, 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 embracing tech in this, uh, offering different models. But it's a very slowly process because, like I said, I understand it partly. It's, it, the, the, the old model is still working for them. Uh, besides that, when you look at skill sets, uh, um, there, there, you don't see a lot of different skill sets also in law firms. Uh, yeah, project managers, you see more and more. But on the technical side, for instance, when you look in the Netherlands, I think there are five law firms who have legal engineers on their payroll. 
uh, but that's that's th th those 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 functions are raising in the Netherlands also. But it it mentions you have to train also people on that, and and, and it don't have to be. Um, and we we Claire and I are an example for that. Don't have to be uh, people with a with a with a legal background, but you have to understand what the pain is of a of the legal industry and, and what what the practice is of a legal industry. But you don't have to be a lawyer. On the other side, lawyers don't have to be coders or technicians eh? uh, they have to be they, they have to have people on board who understand that but the good thing would be if lawyers um, would be would be told how to use technology so they have to be uh, they have to be um, uh, educated in that in in using technology within their practice and there's a gap i would say uh, uh, in the Netherlands, the, the, the University of Applied Sciences are in the front row of innovation of that and the front row of innovating education for legal. And uh, the, the law schools are slowly adapting to that. Uh, I see good results here and I'm living near uh, the University of Radboud in Nijmegen. I see good results in that. There are, there are professors teaching their students, their law students, uh, uh, making smart contracts on the blockchain, for instance using those kind of technologies so to understand to make it applicable in their practice so it's changing but the, the industry is changing very 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 slowly the reason is that i'm saying that i'm doing this for 10 years already so uh I'm, i was hoping we were uh uh, uh five years ago uh, on this stage i also hoped uh, in COVID times that that it would be uh, increasing much more faster, but like I said, it 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 was it worked for for clients or for the corporate legal departments, but it didn't work for law firms yet. But time will tell, I would say. And 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 the the yet is the most important part, and and it's so uh, uh, important the perspective, of course, of Jerome, uh, because being the lawyer uh, 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 <laughs> I always smile uh, when uh, we say that lawyers don't many lawyers do and uh, I do think there's a also uh, uh, some dimensions that we are forgetting in a sense first because one thing is lawyers that also work in uh, legal departments when I came to the Netherlands, I went from being a lawyer with a, a, our own practice and then going to a legal department, which completely changed my mindset. Yeah. And I was not prepared for that. I was prepared to be a lawyer. I was trained with this bar association to, and, and I understood we didn't have even the understanding. I remember Jerome hearing the term legal engineer and not understanding what people were talking about. I remember the first contract manager that I met that he told me that he had a degree in economics and it was like so you are not uh, you don't have a law degree so it was very confusing so i do think there's a dissonance between even the, the conversations we are having because most lawyers don't even know what we are talking about and then there's a new world that is coming and that's the new world of the applied science that by the end of an llb don't we are not producing lawyers we have jurists or legal counsels. And so in a way, the change also includes to understand the layers. And ultimately, for the legal department change that I believe Jeroen for sure are in, in what it's the, the lead. But I can tell you uh, with no uh, violation of confidentiality that I know for a fact that big corporate also spent uh, uh, quite some investment in structures for their legal department, the in-house. And as Claire was saying about their own management, education management system, it was not uh, being fully used. And give you an example of one of the council, uh, councils that didn't use the document control, he still has the printed of the binders and said, no, that is nonsense and he kept using his own binder. So I do think it's generational, it's also understanding the potential that we take from tech, as Ms. Claire was saying. And sometimes uh, I always think it's like having a, a Ferrari in a person that just got their driver's license. So sometimes you have a tool and you don't even know how to 
uh, take advantage of the tool. So there's so many dimensions of the problem. Uh, and I do think that we are now talking to many people that will not become lawyers, but they will become contract managers. They will become many other professions and, and potentially that will be the big uh, breakthrough that we're also waiting because lawyers all also want to do other things. I took contract management certifications. I did the PPO certification. So I think the lawyers of the future also will want to have more freedom to explore other dimensions. And and do, do you agree with this, Sir John? Can you tell us a little bit about your own uh, path uh, and, and, and your vision a little bit for this? Don't forget in the, the next round, we will talk about specific pains uh, of, of, that you can see now, but tell us a little bit about you. What are you seeing at this moment? And what are you doing as well to, to um, for us to understand? Thank you, Marisa. First of all, um, I'm very grateful and proud to be here with you, Jeroen and, and, and Claire. Um, I feel that uh, the narrative is changing uh, when it comes to transforming the legal industry. However, I couldn't agree more with, with Jeroen that it's, it's very slow. Right, but just before I introduce myself properly, um, just because I don't want to forget, um, uh, th there's there is a certain similarity, but also um, uh, something that is very different between general counsels and lawyers uh, within law firms. Uh, from my experience, uh, general counsels are more open to innovation because, uh, especially when they're uh, running legal departments in innovative industries such as you know IT, for example. Uh, they tend to adopt the culture of the company, which is very uh, different from a law firm. Well, the culture is different. So uh, it's, it, from my experience, uh, GCs, uh, and uh, I'll talk about it later uh, in the second part, um, you, you know, always want to see how they can optimize their costs, how they can uh, uh, transform the way they're providing legal services to their one client and that's the company. Uh, however, uh, and this is just to state that uh, nothing can be generalized. However, for example, in Serbia um, and in large parts of Southeast Europe, uh, it's vice versa. Lawyers are more open to innovation. For example, the, the chapter I found that we all have uh, uh, partners from, from uh, uh, leading law firms in, in Southeast Europe and uh, uh, we don't have general counsels. I talked to a lot of them from banks, from IT companies, and it's just the way they're, they're even more conservative uh, than, uh, than lawyers. So back, back to my introduction, I didn't want to lose this, this, this line of thought. So um, again, my name is Serjan Dejanovic. Um, and uh, I know, especially for non-Slavic people, um, I, I believe it's very hard to pronounce J. <laughs> so anything between Serdan and Surgeon is, is fine with me. Um, I have two main aspects of my involvement in legal transformation. The first one is the business, the business one, and the other one is the institutional one. So uh, first, I'm going to uh, tell you a little, uh, a little story. It's basically my point of view when it comes to legal transformation. And then I will uh, uh, just briefly explain each aspect, both the business and the institutional one. So once upon a time before blockchain, before AI, before mobile apps, the cloud, so all this fancy tech stuff, um, you uh, had uh, lawyers, uh, legal work, which could only done, be done bespoke. Uh, you know, uh, you can imagine already in your head, like uh, uh, lawyers, legal, legal practitioners buried in paperwork, working tirelessly for hours, you know, making the big bucks, uh, wearing, you know, uh, uh, suits and, and going with suitcases, et cetera, et cetera. You know, legal work, work could be done only manually, right? And there was no alternative. And then when you go fast forward uh, uh, into present day, a lot of has changed. You know, technology has changed, not, the, not just the way we communicate and work, it has changed our, the way we think. But uh, if you think about it, not a, lot of, not a lot has changed in the legal world. The same, pretty much the same picture we had, you know, like, I don't know how many years ago uh, when everything could be done in a certain way, uh, it's still pretty much the same. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to take part 
Uh, and I'm also not a lawyer. I, I was practicing law, but I'm not a lawyer anymore. So this is one of the reasons why I wanted to take part in legal transformation. So back, back to the two aspects. First, the business one. Um, I'm the co-founder of Dianovich Law and Tech. It's a legal tech company focusing on legal transformation. It has two, three main uh, lines of business. The first one is um, corporate education. So uh, as, as you already mentioned, um, I created the legal transformation program, uh, which has been adopted or I transferred exclusively uh, the IP rights for Central and Eastern Europe to PwC. Uh, the program is in line with their uh, new law initiative, which comes from a couple of, uh, which actually started from a couple of uh, uh, big shot partners from uh, the US and the UK. So basically it's a, a new, strategically new way of thinking about legal services and providing basically merging consulting and legal services and providing uh, legal transformation services to law firms and uh, corporate legal departments. So uh, the, the program itself is very holistically, very holistically views legal transformation, not only from the tech side, but from, from innovation side, from the process side. Um, and uh, I encourage people to, to uh, take a look at it, to take a look at the curriculum, take a look um, at how it's sequentially ordered. And I, I believe they, uh, uh, they will find a lot of value in it. The second part is uh, software engineering. So basically we're a software engineering company, but we uh, focus niche, focus our niche market is the legal industry. And one of the main, let's say unique selling points is uh, it, I, I love to, to tell this story because it, it basically, it, it's, it, it, uh, it tells really good uh, um, how, how we position ourselves. So I, I had a call from a partner from a, a law firm uh, from uh, Germany, and they wanted to make to, to develop an M and A tool, right? So my first my first question was which far which phase of M and A are we talking about? And then he was like, "Oh man, I forgot you know what M and A is." Uh, I talked to a lot of uh, I talked to a lot of uh, you know outsourcing companies that do software outsourcing in Serbia, and I had like couple of hours just explaining what the M&A process is like. And we, we have, we bridge that communication gap. So we basically, we know what the client uh, wants when they want to develop the solution. And I think this is one of the biggest values. And the third part um, is uh, a spin-off company, a spin-off startup called Gap App. It's something that we're very excited about. It's our own product, legal tech product, uh, but I think it transcends uh, the legal industry, uh, but more about that later. Um, and this is from the business side and from the institutional side, which I think is equally important. I'll tell you why later. Um, is uh, I'm as, as you already mentioned, I'm uh, the ambassador of Elta for Serbia, uh, director of uh, uh, Elta's chapter for Southeast Europe. It was first uh, just only for Serbia, but we expanded to Southeast Europe. I'm very happy about it because this is the first. Uh, we managed to create the first legal tech community and ecosystem um, in a market which isn't very uh, mature and developed in the first place. But I'm very happy that we managed to bring all the key stakeholders uh, in the legal industry from uh, leading law firms, big law firms to uh, big four companies. And I'm happy to say that we're, we're still, it's not just, you know, on paper, we're still meeting almost every month. Uh, we're still we're actually having big project ahead of us. So uh, I'd like to thank, uh, to take this opportunity to thank Helta and all of you for, for your amazing support. And um, I'm very happy that, that I'm part of the team and that we continue to push something we believe in um, uh, and try to make a difference at least. And, and, and we will for sure. And that's exactly the aim of this webinars. And, and again, I think for this first round, what we can see is that innovation and change is also uh, uh, propelled by individuals that have multi layers. Uh, a lawyer that becomes a legal tech entrepreneur, uh, uh, myself uh, being a general counsel and a lawyer, even in do two different jurisdictions doing completely different things, and understanding also the pain of managing a business, understanding the tech world. Jerome trying to engage his technical knowledge for so many years with law firms, so he knows the pains 
um, his own perspective technology and also uh, not only of thinking but trying to implement so he really understood the difficulties from the ground uh, for a long time it's not even a pilot so it's a mature thought of, of needs and and uh, miss moore your perspective also of the business side the management the, also the knowledge uh, uh, management education with your technical engineering side. I think in a way, it's exactly when you mix all these capacities that of course the result is seeing a world in a different way and bring this uh, um, added value in a way. So individuals are the real added, val added value that then potentiate the tech, the development or the use of the technology, as you also, Ms. Moore said, we are here to technology is to support. We keep having this idea that technology will uh, be just a destruction of, of, of jobs. Or, and, and as for example, yesterday we had a meeting with the legal hackers, uh, the hate community, and we were talking much more about all the, all the almost this idea of this co-pilot uh, that technology would do. Uh, this 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 uh, empowerment actually of professionals and not the other way around. So um, with that in mind, the sec in the second round, I really would like us to take and to choose from what are the main pains that you choose specific ones that you want to approach um, in this training. What you believe are the key uh, 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 challenges of the field and how companies train their staffs. So identify each one or, or reinforce, but um, this time uh, maybe starting with Sharoon and then we go to Miss Claire and then we uh, go to Sir John. What do you think, Jeroen, uh, um, that you would choose in the many difficulties uh, that you know for a fact that exist that are now uh, in this training, because, because in a way you mentioned that was already difficult, because you you tried uh, uh, so hard to work with with um, law firms, and you quit. So now you are out. So that that is a problem. But what would you choose as your favorite pain of the field of the training of, of stuff? Uh, creating a more open mindset to, to technology, I would say. Yeah? That, that, that's the biggest thing. Uh, and understand what it is. It's, it, it sounds a little bit strange from a guy who has a technical background, but it's not only about... When you look at legal innovation, it's not alone, only about tech. Tech is a facilitator in this, but it's not only about tech. Um, uh, so look at what your pain is and when you have a, you're a part of a legal department or you're part of a law firm look what your pain is or when you're part of a law firm look what the gain is for your for your for your client in this sense uh, so look at a different perspective to your client not as a what i call call legal people firemen eh? for instance uh, the, the general counsel is the head fireman of a fire station. So when there is a fire, he's going to drive to it. He never looks at it from a further perspective. How can we solve this problem in a more continuous way uh, with, for instance, technology? Uh, determine what your low-hanging fruit is within your law firm or your law or legal department and solve that with maybe a different approach in procedure or using technology in that sense. Uh, don't be afraid for technology because technology is a uh, is gonna uh, empower you, like like you said, Marisa, empower you in your practice. I would say, uh, like like uh, lawyers hundred years ago did with their pen. Uh, this is their new pen, um, uh, and and and, and that, that has to be open mind. And the strange thing is when you look at the legal, for instance, law firms, and you talk about legal innovation. A lot of law firms say, "Ah, but that, that's not for the partners. It's more for the younger people." Uh, my my takeaway on this is, after twenty five years, of law firms, most younger people who are starting at a law firm are much more conservative than the partners are, because the partners are much more business savvy. I would say they're conservative, but much more business savvy. 
And, and most students, especially from the law schools, uh, who are coming from the law schools, are uh, brainwashed with a very conservative sense in not using technology. They're not trained about technology skills or being an entrepreneur or uh, working in business. Uh, so they are very, uh, we are the big, they're coming in and saying, we are the big lawyers now. That's not how it works. Uh, so younger people are not in general, the new innovative guys in the legal industry. You have to train them. You have to, to, to change their mindset in this. And, uh, the biggest thing in, in, in the legal industry is not buying technology because I got a lot of questions uh, from, from law firms or in-house departments. June, what AI product should I buy? Uh, so, but that's a very strange question. Uh, first of all, I'm not the Amazon of legal tech, uh, uh, but what is your pain? And maybe your pain is changing your, your procedure in this and not using AI because you want to send out a press release that your law firm is using AI. Uh, that's, that's not the case. So um, the, 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 biggest, the biggest challenge we have in, in, in the legal industry is creating change and awareness. Like I said earlier, my, I mentioned it's, it's, it's quite difficult to do that from inside. Uh, we have a saying in the Netherlands, uh, uh, strange eyes uh, will enforce you to change. Um, uh, uh, and I think that, that that is working in my case, uh, uh, because I have a lot of experience in, in changing that. And if you're on the payroll of a law firm, it's quite difficult to do that. Because partners will say, that's nice to hear you, I go going further with my practice now and, and, may, and do my hourly rate uh, 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 invoicing. Um, so that, that, that's quite good. So awareness is, is the biggest thing, I would say. And, and, and it, it is true because when I share, uh, uh, I came 10 years ago, not yet so much, uh, uh, Claire, as you, uh, I have to learn the language, uh, but I, I have conversations with lawyers that are uh, working with me in Portugal. And I say, if I would have said, if I would not have the change of the country that changed my life and my mindset, even if I already had a path that I, uh, because back then I already uh, took a certification for mediation. So I was curious by nature. I understand that. But I think I would have um, follow a natural path of my colleagues. The, the new country and also to try to adjust myself to a different uh, um, a strategy that was in my mind creates this necessity. Also that we were mentioned, the pandemic created necessity of things that were already there. I was working from the Netherlands to Portugal in a pre-pandemic world that was so difficult to explain. Why could I do that? Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think it's a little bit also seeing that it's also the pain of the pioneer thoughts because everybody will come to tell you that it's not possible when you know even if it's already possible. And for example, Sir John was talking about creating a community that goes uh, with the awareness, uh, Jerome. Uh, for example, I saw the community in the Netherlands, how vital it, were, it already was. All oh, this topic was so uh, um, already worked about. There was the community, you already have started community. There was so much conferences that I could go all the time and then when I created uh, myself with an in, a head of innovation and an ex-judge, the Institute for Legal Innovation and Technology in Portuguese, in Portugal, and even Alta back then, it was not to talk about it. It was to start talking about it. So the maturity is so difficult. Mm -hmm. And for example, I feel like in the Netherlands, it's so much nicer to talk about the topics because you find people with your maturity that create community, that bring awareness. In some countries, for example, like Sir John or myself, that we are literally uh, um, uh, starting. And I get very nervous to talk with lawyers, for example, because I feel that um, it's like I'm trying to talk with them as it, we need to change. And, but at the same time, I hear, oh, I see posts online as I see this week in a Portuguese uh, uh, group of lawyers, and they were so upset because a law firm opened an office next to uh, 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 um, uh, an advertisement of an insurance company. 
and they were berserk. The end is coming. There's no more dignity of the profession. Again, there's no business savviness. While many of the law firms that do have the business savviness are not in that conversation anymore. And, and I try politely to say, forget the insurance company being next to you. Are you ready for the metaverse? <laughs> I know, I was a little bit mean. But I think that's a little bit also, the having people from different, different backgrounds helps. Having a lawyer that admires the work of Jeroen and not attacking him, and even trying to find a common language. I think it's so much important for the, us at this moment. And Jeroen, I'm very happy that I was invited for the Bar Association for this courses that they have to start talking about the topic because I never lost the hope that the bars would come a little bit to open the path. Very slowly, very difficult. And also lawyers are afraid. I comment with Sir John, the rules and regulations of the professions also, sometimes it's not even that you don't want to change, you are afraid of changing because you are afraid of retaliations from the bars associations that are not allow you to innovate properly as you should. So I would like to leave this not to defend lawyers, but sometimes to say, we really also need to push the ones that are stopping, the ones that want to change because it's it's so complicated to do. And, and Claire, what, what do you think then that you would choose room, of course, shows about the awareness and, and you know so well how important it is. But from your perspective also, because uh, now that you are in this new role, um, what do you think it will be uh, 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 your choice? Of, of so, so my choice is, is probably not just relevant for um, digital tech, but any type of tech, uh, and that's digital literacy. Um, the not understanding things is what brings the fear. Um, and so like a lot of what has been said as well, like IT in its essence, and it was one of the main things I tried to um, bring to my business students when I was teaching them is there's three components. It's the people, it's the process, and then the hardware and software. And you don't get anywhere if you forget one of those pieces. So if you have, you know, as you were saying, you're, you know, it's, it's not which AI system do I have? And, and it's in a way, it's like years ago, you know, everybody had to have a SAP system. So, you know, they spent an awful lot of money with, you know, IBM or one of the other big companies to bring this system in, but they hadn't thought about what is it I need to solve? And then, you know, it either stayed on the, the shelf. And that's also why we had this big IT, you know, bubble that burst was because people were buying things and were being sold things that they didn't need. And it's more about thinking about what do you need? But for that, you need this digital literacy. Um, and also to, you know, blow the myth that just because you're young, you understand IT. That's also not true. <laughs> you know, because I can download an app and use it doesn't mean I understand IT. If, if that app doesn't work or if it doesn't work immediately, most teenagers just get rid of it and they look for something else um, where, you know, I'm you and you're in, you're probably from the same kind of IT time as me. If it didn't work first, we played around with it until it did work because yeah. not every system works straight away. So it, uh, and I think that that digital literacy, so um, it's not that everybody, it's, it's not just purely a, a, a generational thing. And of course there are some aspects that are, are generational, um, but getting people to understand, you know, what is this digital world? Because of course, then it's the legal tech, but it's also the laws that are going to become around uh, digitalization. There's a the whole legal design, which can definitely help, but that's an intersection thing where designers and lawyers have to come together. And then also with the people who can then, you know, digitalize it and, and make it accessible to people. But it's, it's a lot of different types of uh, people coming together, but that digital literacy, understanding some of the things, that's, that's really important, but that's important for the whole digital transition. So it, yeah, it's, it's a big challenge. It, it's a big challenge, but it's a, such a great uh, uh, choice. 
and pinpoint it. So, so John, in a way of pinpointing, because you know that in the third uh, and last round, uh, we do have a question, uh, uh, and but the question is being answered. Uh, uh, the difficulties of change and everything. So I will leave that for the next round because um, I think it will encapsulate exactly what we're going to try to talk in, in after. But Sir John, choosing the the pain, what pain do you choose? Oh, um, well, you know, there, there are uh, pretty much standard answers to that. Uh, we already talked and answers uh, which have be which have already been mentioned um, like awareness um, uh, lack lack of technological awareness etc um, but I would just before before I go to the pain point I would just like to note that uh, these issues and these challenges cannot uh, be limited just to the private sector so it's not just about law firms it's not just about you know uh, consultants big four companies I I, I uh, directly uh, saw the pain points in the public sector as well. Um, actually, I was a part of the work group uh, which drafted the Digital Assets Act. So basically the first crypto regulation here in Serbia. And I, al I also saw that uh, regulators need uh, um, a training in, in, uh, in technology as well. And I'm not just talking about technology, like specific technologies. I, I honestly believe that people who uh, write legislation, who draft legislation need to be more focused on innovation because, you know, the digitization of, of regulation is already upon us. You know, we already have the GDPR. We already have, you know, the e-commerce directive. We already have all these things. And one of the biggest challenges we, we had was to balance from the, technology agnostic approach because obviously tech uh, develops a lot faster than regulation so we need to have a more general approach so we don't change the regulation every time the technology changes but on the other hand if you uh, don't stay true the specific characteristics of cryptography or distributed ledger technology then what's the point of writing new regulation for digital assets right so i i, I just want to say that uh, uh, these challenges are very very much important important in the public sector as well. And I, I would like to uh, give emphasis to, to uh, that also. So, and uh, what I found uh, as I'm going to choose my, my first or my key uh, uh, pain point, if you will, is uh, a few months ago, a leading law firm in Southeast Europe uh, called, called me to um, uh, provide them with uh, training for legal tech for their lawyers. And uh, I talked to the partners and they said, okay, problem lawyers are very demotivated. Even after we gave them some, some, um, uh, some trainings, even be before we talked to you, right? So my first thought was uh, they were demotivated after the training. Yeah, we, we had some trainings about AI with, and blockchain, how they work, et cetera, et cetera. So my, my first thing was that instantly I said, okay, don't focus on technology, focus on the value that technology brings and focus on how lawyers can use that technology to generate value. And they were like, yeah, but if you don't understand technology, then, you know, you can be a legal engineer, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, you know, obviously I, I, I started the training um, and there were like a bunch of lawyers there. So uh, we had the same issue, right? We have we talked about how they had trainings and um, uh, they were demotivated because they were boring, blah, blah, blah. So I asked, uh, how many of you have smartphones? Obviously, all of them raised their hand. They all have TikToks, Instagrams. They're very popular on social media, right? Okay. So how many of you know how smartphones work? How many of you can explain how smartphones work? Nobody raised their hand. So because they, in general, don't have, you know, if, if you, if you, uh, uh, if you uh, force a lawyer to go on a lecture where an engineer speaks about how AI works, I'm afraid, not all of them, obviously, two and a half percent are innovators, they'll be very thrilled, they will learn about, you know, AI and everything else, but a large majority of them will say, oh man, first of all, I don't, I don't understand anything. How can 
explaining how AI algorithms work helped me in my everyday job. I have everyday issues with my everyday clients. How can I make it better? So my, my, my first, the, 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 the framing, the problem so is John, not I really need you to find one. So John, yeah, I really a, need you to yeah, find one framing because I really want to go to the third round for the solution. The so let's find <laughs> Not one. focusing on technology. <laughs> Not to focusing on technology Not per se. On technology. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, no problem. I just really okay. need this is the, the, the bad cop rule. Unfortunately, today is mine. Um, but it, it's very important and it will allow us for going to the, the now the round about solutions because we keep talk, talking about the problems. It, it, it's so easy to complain. But it's also, uh, again, Sir John we keep talk, talking about lawyers. And I think you said also something very important about the public and the private. Uh, if, if the people that follow ELTA and were in the ELTACON in Madrid or this year, we had people from the public sector or judges. or So we're talking about a legal ecosystem. And I think when we talk about legal tech, we uh, forget the ecosystem in, in, in a sense and the many different professions that someone with a law degree can have and roles. And the difference between the regulator and the governance. If you remember Jerome, uh, the secretary of, of the Minister of Justice of, uh, of Portugal that went to Madrid and everybody was so enthusiastic. A woman that came from the technological side, she didn't have a law degree. Mm. I wonder why she was so innovative. And, and we know that also the ministries of justice have now uh, innovation departments. Uh, uh, the Dutch minister of justice has an innovation department. So also understanding the layers and understanding the system and the ecosystem will allow us to uh, uh, gain the capacity of a common language. Because I do feel like we have this barrier you know, in, in an event in, in, uh, in August, I was talking about with people from uh, legal tech and I was saying, okay, let's start by understanding that some terms are used as law tech, others talk legal tech. There's still some uh, dwelling of definitions. And of course, this is more a conversation of a lawyer. And then someone from, no, no, but we don't need those definitions. We just need to innovate. I think, okay, I need to understand processes and technology, but you need to understand communication. Mm -hmm. If we don't have the understanding of what we're talking about, we're not talking about even of the same things. So this common language with the technological part, but also the system part and understanding what we are talking will allow better training. When we talk about training, it's also different from education. One thing is educating is the systems, is the beautiful programs that are designed by the universities that can also be improved. But another thing is training. A trainer is not a professor and he should have received training to train people, by the way. So all this in-depth analysis is also what is needed to go to a more mature place, I would say. And that's my uh, um, uh, contribution uh, that I would like us to start understanding that it matters. Communication matters. If algorithms are designed in a language, words have meaning, so word is not an opinion. There's definition. That's why we have these beautiful dictionaries that can also change, but again, it's a common understanding of what we're saying. So solutions, solutions, what are the solutions? Um, Sir so John, so solutions. Yes, I'm going to be mean. Let's start with okay. you. Because you are also um, still a little bit, I think you are the youngest in the room. And, and I want to understand that from the perspective of someone that wants to change and punch the system. Solutions for this pain that you identify. So each one of us are going to change, take a, a solution for the pain and then talk a little bit and hopefully then I can um, um, and maybe before you talk about solutions uh, 
the question that we received was a little bit big, but is in a way, why do you think that change the legal market here, legal market, not industry? From why do you think that change the legal market from the inside is difficult? I understand that as all other changes, it will be difficult, but why would it be more difficult from the inside? I think this was about your comment, Jeroen. Yep. Uh, that said, uh, by um, is really trying to make the change, but would like to remain. Oh, okay. So from his own perspective, like this is someone that wants to not quit, Jeroen. <laughs> he wants to make the change inside and not leave it. So keep that in mind, because please don't forget that you need to give some hope. No, it's still possible, and maybe I would say it's possible by bringing people like Jerome to increase your capacity from the inside to push the change. This is a work that needs to be done by many, not by one. But, Sir John, your pain, your solution uh, 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 for immediate uh, um, capacity. And again, not in five years' time, not... Uh, with quantum computing and, and AI singularity. Now, what can we do now? Everybody does today in this webinar, either lawyers, either general counsels, whatever is our public for your pain, what is your proposed solution for now? Besides your training uh, that everybody should go and see um, that will be available. Uh, be practical. Practicality. Just practicality. Uh, as as uh, Jerome, like hands on. Well, sorry. Like in a sense of hands on. Yes, because you know, uh, lawyers are uh, uh, well, actually partners um, are text are business savvy people. So you know, uh, they usually follow the money. So being practical, first of all, being practical in framing the problem. Problems exist, you know, uh, and it's not just fear. Fear just theory it's very well known right there are statistics there are, you know different testimonies etc <coughs> sorry about that so when it comes to solution uh, there are, um, it's it, they're not a lot but there are still use cases uh, real life use cases uh, which demonstrate how things can be done digital transformation is not new it's just very specific when it comes to the legal industry, but it has success stories, right? So be practical in framing the problem and be practical in delivering solutions. Lawyers will listen to practical solutions or practical recommendations. They can all, they, they can all relate to certain stuff. And when you find common ground, just push forward with practical uh, um, know-how and, and experience. Um, because I firmly believe that when, when we talk about training, it's uh, very different from the academic approach. The corporate, the corporate education approach is basically focusing on practicality because you can talk to, stu to students of law how they can implement legal tech because they, all, they, they, they don't have uh, experience in legal pra practicing the law. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's very difficult. So just to be sure, I, I don't want to repeat my, my mistakes from the from, <laughs> uh, last couple of times. And, and we are... From, we are abusing time. I can uh, now confirm that we are three minutes past, but with the kindness of the guests and the kindness of um, uh, the people uh, today, we will stretch a little bit because it, it's impossible not to. Uh, so we're not giving you tick time, tick time bomb. Please make sure that we have a few more minutes. But with that said, Jerome, the solution for the immediate pain, knowing that we will be here for many, many more webinars, but for now, what you want to leave? And also uh, responding the provocation a little bit of the one that wants to change inside that for, for sure he can. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite easy. Kill the fear, I would say. And it's on the side of the lawyer, it's on the side of the bar, it's on the side of the regulator, on everything. And I would say create an appetite for experimenting. Uh, which is quite easy for people who are trained as a lawyer or, or as, a le as legal people, because you're, you're trained to think within the box. And, and we as innovation people, 
are, are outside the box thinkers. So communication is quite quite hard in that. Um, uh, but but uh, inspire them uh, with with use cases, to, so they recognize themselves in that. Uh, 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 use uh, techniques like legal design thinking. Not, I'm not talking about legal design, but legal design mm -hmm. thinking, because legal design is one a very small part, I think, uh, of of the innovation area uh, of legal. Um, uh, but legal design thinking can help you to think outside of that box. Uh, uh, um, uh, use mentors. Uh, uh, for instance, I'm a mentor to 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 currently five uh, teams in the corporate part in a legal. Uh, 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 but at law firms, um, also a part of my time, I have 5% of my time I work as an entrepreneur, I'm using to inspire students what, what to do uh, in the legal industry because the legal industry is changing. Um, so use, use my time, use my 5% in that. Um, um, so that, 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 would my, that would be my takeaway, Marissa. Oh, and it's a perfect one. And like I say, please understand that I uh, count to take advantage of Jeroen's <laughs> knowledge. Uh, so you will be one of our uh, common victims. Uh, but again, I think also what Jeroen is saying is very important. Not only what he's doing, but he dedicated already much of his time also building community. So understand the importance of being um, sharing because legal design thinking uh, uh, that I not being able to design anything. I always say I'm a legal design thinker because I understand the, the method and that's what allows us to uh, cooperate also in teams and understand how we can do things differently. But uh, not forget that this is, is very, very important that we are still exchanging. This is not something that is a product that you have tons and tons of books, jurisprudence, doctrine. Well, we are in uncharted territories in an infancy. So let's let's keep working together. And, and knowing that we will invite you more times for sure. And hopefully who knows after the pandemic that we can even um, uh, reinforce the building of the community uh, uh, in, in the Netherlands, in, in all our countries. But again, today we have three people based in the Netherlands. So hopefully we can do more as well. But solutions for the pains, uh, Ms. Moore, of your own pain, uh, what would you leave us today with? Um, well, it's kind of very similar to you. It, it's just try um, experiment, uh, but also don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, digital literacy isn't that you have to understand everything. Um, but that you can go, hey, this is my problem, and I'm, I'm looking for ways of solving this. And whether that ends up being a different process or an IT system that can help you in it, it's about having those uh, conversations and collaborating with people. Um, and of course, education. <laughs> but hey, that's my, my, my world. <laughs> there is another question in the Q&A box, also for you, Jeroen, um, about blockchain. Um, oh yeah, it just came. Yep. Yeah, it was at one thirty-three. There was a, exactly when I was saying that we had three minutes past the time. Yep. Uh, question came. Uh, yes, Jeroen, are you able to see it? I'm looking now. Yeah. Ah, okay. okay. It's a little bit big, but please let's try to still, or not, depending on what you think. Uh, but we we have the question here. So Jeroen. I'm just re I'm reading. I know. But the, but the question is, uh, okay, who is doing this? Uh, can I imagine lawyers coding? So, uh, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. The, the 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 example I mentioned is from uh, Professor Andre Janssen, uh, who is a professor at the Radboud University in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, um, they're using a platform called Juro, uh, which is a, um, uh, how do you call that? A dispute resolution uh, platform, which is using, uh, is used uh, globally. Uh, and he is training their, his students with that. So he's not training them to, 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 code, like you mentioned in your, your question. Uh, partly it's code, eh? it's, it's more scripting, I would say. Um, uh, and how to use that. 
Uh, I hope that that's an answer to the question. I, I will, I will, I kept the text itself. So I will share with you later, Jeroen. Also, I took uh, uh, the name of uh, the person that uh, uh, provide this question. And again, this can even be a hook for another webinar. So it's also about uh, engaging with us. Please, the ones who are today as guests, engage with us. Uh, uh, um, make uh, us also feel your pains in the Alta Academy, and we will try to bring that knowledge as well for you. Um, there's nothing better than this idea. Also, this is a, a way of cooperating and, and it's very important. So don't forget conversations, cooperations, and education, as Ms. Moore said, as three vital uh, uh, pillars for us to continue to learn. From my side today, knowing that this is just the beginning, this is, a begin this is also, a, for me, a personal path. I need to learn more. I understood that I didn't know what I needed to know, and I wanted to know more, but also, for the technical people, understand that you need the legal minds. This is a cooperation by design. You will not be able to encapsulate all the skills you need. A little bit like happened with GDPR. A DPO should never have been a person, should have been an office and not an officer. I do believe that this area is exactly the same thing. And when you try to think about solutions to train, Think if, if uh, uh, training for the understanding, the global understanding is sometimes better than try to also force train, training that is not um, the best. Lawyers should understand what it means to code. Do they need to code? I can tell you that I took a class. It was good for me to understand the process, but I don't want to code, but I understood the process. Do uh, uh, IT people that work in law firms need to know law? No, but they need to communicate. So I think about it's smart choices. And again, we that's why we need consultants like in any area of business. That's why also we need to bring people with other mindset, with other capacities and other skills. It's a fake idea that a lawyer will encapsulate all. Law firms or legal departments just have different structures, and you will have multidisciplinary teams for sure. So don't get in panic when you think, oh my God, I don't know how to code. Uh, I'm dead. No, you know, and you can also change. As our guests were saying, uh, uh, I want to change in the system. Yes, you can bring allies. We are all here to cooperate for sure. We have open minds. That's why we are a little bit more pioneering and navigating uncharted waters. So it was a pleasure for this first webinar. We will meet you soon. Engage with Elta, engage with us, engage with our guests. Uh, they have LinkedIn profiles. Uh, uh, they were already tagged in our post in Elta. So please feel free, don't be shy. And as Ms. Moore well said, keep asking, keep asking questions, kill the fear as Jerome said, and let's keep being positive, as Sir John also led us. Like there's there's solutions, hands on, hands on. Thank you so much. It, much. it was a pleasure, and see you soon. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye.